Welcome to chapter 3, viewing hardware resources. Now before we will apply any tuning techniques, before we're going to change any, any settings in our operating system, first of all we need to find out what kind of hardware we are dealing with. So it's, it's actually crucial for you to be able to see what kind of hardware you have on your hands. Uh, CPU types, architecture, interconnections, all this information can be pretty, pretty, pretty very easily fetched from the, from the operating system perspective. So first of all, we have four main uh, resource types. So definitely we have CPU. Now the CPU is the heart of the, or, or the brain of the, of the computer, so it's a, it's a microchip that uh, can execute arithmetic and logical operations against the data that is being provided to it. CPUs come in different sizes and shapes, architectures, and uh, with more modern technology, CPUs become very, very smart. They have multiple threads, multiple cores. So one, one piece of silicone actually has like several smaller CPUs inside of that uh, in a very compact uh, form. So CPUs are one of the, it, it is the most important uh, component of the CPU because it detect, dictates the overall performance of the entire system. So knowing what kind of CPU you have, uh, what, is it, what, is, what is the connector, um, what, uh, how, do, how, do, how do your cores talk to each other, how are they interconnected, do they share any, any uh, do they have any shared uh, resources like cache maybe? Knowing this allows you to understand how your system performs and also it allows you to understand the system's limitations. A second, a second resource we care about uh, is a system memory. So it's a volatile memory, which means after you stop providing power, it loses its contents. So RAM is a, is a second most important component of the, of the computer because it is used to uh, transfer data to the CPU. Not directly, because in, in simple terms, whatever is stored in the memory can be easily transferred to the cache, level, layer, level, le level 2, level 3, level 4 cache of the CPU, and the CPU can transfer this information to its level 1 for processing. So usually uh, the memory, memory will dictate how fast the data can be transferred to your CPU and the CPU will consume it. Um, the next thing we care about are the storage devices. So either these are hard drives, um, uh, flash-based, rotational, SSD, solid-state drives, Mm, they're usually huge, large, they, they, they come in, 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 in rather large capacities, but they are very, very slow. C comparing to, for example, comparing to system memory, the disks are s s s slower by a huge margin. This can be 4,000 times more slower or even more. So there's a huge disproportion in the, in the, in the, in the throughput between storage devices and memory. And also this is one of the things that Linux is doing absolutely wonderfully, which, which is uh, whatever is stored on the hard disk, if it can be moved into memory and stored in memory for a longer period of time, the system will try to do that, eliminating, uh, eliminating the need for I.O. operations touching hard drives. So uh, storage devices are the third, third kind of resources, and we need to know what kind of disks do we have. Uh, are they SSD drives, are they NVMe, what interconnects do we have, uh, are they enterprise grade or consumer grade. Now the fourth kind of resources, those are the networking devices, and they also dictate how fast we can communicate with the outside world. So nowadays with pretty much everything connected to the internet or interconnected with other machines and devices, networking component is very, very important. So you need to know what kind of network equipment do you have, what are the possible technical speeds, what are the limitations, uh, the number and the fault tolerance of your configuration. We can easily uh, see all this information uh, and we need to know that before we will apply any tuning, tuning techniques. Now also it's important to understand that different architectures have different interconnects, the way the components are connected to each other. Um, the, 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 standard, the standard PCs may have a, a very slow, uh, very cheap in the manufacturing process interconnect the servers on the other hand when the performance is absolutely uh, important, they may have very sophisticated, very expensive interconnects allowing us to transfer large amounts of data between components very efficiently. That's pretty much the difference between the servers and the desktop systems. Uh, the interconnects are different. Now, I would like you to have a look at the figure 3.1. Uh, 
uh, again coming from Brandon Gregg and his collection of tools. We have uh, a little overview of the operating system and its design. So we have the application stack, we have system libraries, we have system call interface, the virtual file system, and the entire input-output system, the networking socket, scheduler, virtual memory management. And as you can see, Brendan created a nice collection of tools, command line tools, which can be used to fetch the information from the different subsections of the hardware, figuring out what you have in the system is actually crucial. So it's a good idea for you, and, and I would say, uh, this is my suggestion, print it out, put it on the, on the wall, and get used to that view, because knowing all these tools is absolutely crucial. So we're going to start with the first, call, first command. It's absolutely uh, basic. Being able to fetch the kernel messages. The command for that is dmask. dmask, diagnostic messages. You run the command, and it will show you the last entries, probably all of them. But it's, uh, it's a fixed length buffer. It can be changed, but it's a fixed length buffer. So it, it is possible that it will overflow with information. You may lose your oldest entries. You will see only the most recent ones. Still, it's, uh, it's a lot of information to, to process. Uh, the dmask actually can be also viewed with the use of journal CTL command. The journal D is a, is a, is a is a tool that extends functionality of systemd. So journal d-k, this option will show you the kernel messages. And if you have journal ctl with the persistent uh, configuration, then you will see all of them. dmask may overflow, journal ctl will not. Uh, but basically, they give you the same information. Now, let's see an example dmask. Let's, let's see how many lines do we have. 655 lines in this little workstation. The system is not doing anything useful right now. So it already has 655 lines of output. Um, and it's, it's, it, nobody expects you to read the whole output line by line, because it's, it's, too, it's too much. So you need to learn how to uh, find out particular sections in it, and maybe read the information from the DMASK that way. Mm, so if you run DMASK, let's pipe it through less. The first, the beginning, the first two lines, these two lines, these are the kernel arguments and basically the kernel version as it's being, uh, 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 the version of the kernel we boot. So this is 418.80.1.2 uh, EL80. So we have the kernel version, we have the, the architecture, the information when, where, where the kernel was built, um, the, the compiler, the date of the compilation, and also we have a command line. So this contains the list of arguments the kernel was passed when it was starting. So as you can see, the list is quite long, and all these parameters heavily affect how the system operates. So starting from the line number three, that's where the actual DMESC starts. And from that point, we have 653 lines of output. So reading this information like line by line, you will see sections like uh, the BIOS memory regions, then the, the, for example, the NX, that's a protection. Which is, so this is a BIOS setting, allowing us to enable the non-executive stock, non-executable stock, uh, SMBOS version, uh, hypervisor, whether or not. So in, in this particular example, we're running a virtual machine on top of the physical hypervisor, and the hypervisor has been detected to be KVM. And then we have some uh, memory-related information, and so on and so forth. So this, this contains a lot of very useful information. You don't read it on a, on a, on a, on a, uh, every day, but that contains a lot of very interesting things. So let's say we're interested in, in, in uh, direct memory access, DMA. We can run dmask and just grab for the word DMA. And you're going to get uh, some of them. Actually, this is UDMA, so this is for the hard disk. So we have too much information. But this is the memory information. So how does DMA, how, how is this DMA, how is DMA configured on this particular system? You're looking for memory information. You can grab for, uh, you can grab for memory. And we have some information about how much memory was, was detected, how, mem how much memory was, is available, how much was, con was, was actually claimed by the kernel code, so it can be reclaimed easily and so on and so forth. So this is a very interesting thing. If you search for CPU, on the other hand, you may search CPU-related information. 
Um, so it tells us that, oh, for example, uh, the SMP mechanism was, uh, was activated because a secondary CPU was detected, so it's being brought online. Um, we have information about the SM boot, about the, the, the different flags of the CPU being enabled or disabled on this particular system. Um, what else can we search for? We can grab for uh, huge pages. Let's search for huge. And it tells us that, oh, we have a huge TLB uh, registered with two megabyte page cache. So we have a two megabyte uh, page size, sorry, page size. Uh, we have zero pages allocated. So if you're going to configure huge pages, which we're going to discuss later on, you will see this message in DMESC on the system boot. And also you can see that systemd was kind enough to mount for us a uh, huge page FS. It's one of the other, one of the two methods, how you can, one of the three methods, how you can use huge pages. So the huge page file system is mounted automatically for us. Um, what else can we fetch from the DMESC? Let's say for the mm. IO scheduler, IO. And it tells us that we have three of them registered. This kernel has been configured in a way it has modular uh, IO schedulers. One of them is called MQ Deadline. The other one is called Kyber. The third one is called BFQ. Well, that's one of the biggest changes between RHEL 7 and 8. The IO schedulers, we're going to discuss this in following chapters. So all three of them have been registered. So the kernel may switch between them depending on what you want to, what kind of behavior you'd like to achieve because they d completely differ. They are, they are completely different and they have different goals. Mm, now, whenever there's a situation when the kernel will detect a minor failure, not something major, like you know, major failure, that's a kernel panic. It's a situation when kernel doesn't know what to do, cannot uh, go on. It gets, to this, it gets to the state when it cannot recover. That's a major fa failure. But we also have, may have fa mi minor failures. Usually drivers or some components of the kernel, they cannot complete their task. And that's where you're going to get a stack trace. It's a little output that looks like, uh, like this in the book. So this is, a, this is a t uh, an example output of the, of the kernel trace. It tells us that a, a failure happened. Some operation must have been done, like reload the module, reload the firmware, maybe reinitialize a device. You can read that to find out what kind of failure you are dealing with. Usually, these are f uh, very important warnings. Those are warning lights telling us something bad is happening to the system. Great. Mm. Now, there's one of the parameters uh, that actually I love, uh, and it's a new thing in, in RHEL 8. That's a dmask minus uppercase T. Now, if I pipe it through less, you will see it actually shows the date, exact date and time at which the particular event happened. Now, the thing is that this, the times, as you can see, all the events from this screen are sharing the same exact time. So 1533.02, and this output is not getting more precise. However, the chronology of the events is preserved. So we are absolutely certain that this entry came before that entry. Even though we don't see microseconds or milliseconds, we are certain that that's the way they have been, that's the order in which they happened. So if you're searching for a certain event in your kernel messages, you may very easily find out when things happened. This is extremely useful when you're having stack traces or kernel oops. Uh, that's another way of handling errors. And knowing when it happened allows us to correlate this event with some uh, log files, some events that happened while this, uh, this unfortunate situation took place. Now let's focus on the CPUs first. So, there's a couple of ways how you can see what CPUs you have. The first one is a legacy, is a legacy way. There is a file called proc CPU info. CPU info. Now, basically, it produces a lot of text. It tries to be uh, very verbose. And as you can see, this system has two CPUs. This is the entry for the first one. And it's a processor number zero with the details. And if we scroll down, there's a little white, sp there's an empty line in here. And there we, there, there's the information for processor number one. On the multi-CPU system, you're, you're going to see all of them, 0, 1, 2, 3, whatever number of cap, uh, CPUs you have. And the interesting thing about it is the cache size, for instance, or the model and family. Of course, we're running a virtual machine here. So it tells us this QM of virtual CPU version something. 
On a physical hardware, it will give us the manufacturer, is it either AMD or Intel or ARM CPU or anything like that. Plus, it can give us information about the physical layout, the number of cores, the, 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 the layout of this on the sockets. Plus, it has a very interesting thing called flags. So these are CPU flags, which basically means what functions, what features this CPU does support. And I'm searching for something uh, particular. I can't it see it, so this CPU will not run AES offloading. Uh, modern CPUs uh, have the mechanism called AES, which basically decodes AES cipher on the CPU, making this operation very, very fast. This one, this CPU doesn't have this flag exposed, so it will run deco decode, decode operations on the user land. Plus, as you can see, it has a list of bugs that we detect. We already addressed the MDS, CPU meltdown, Spectre version 1, Spectre version 2, Spec Store Bypass, L1TF. All these are very well known CPU bugs, including the ones I, uh, we mentioned at the beginning of the course. Now, the same information can be also displayed using command LS CPU. Now, the output is slightly different. First of all, it aggregates the information for all CPUs into one output, so there are no several sections. What do we know is that we have two CPUs. Which of them, of which of the CPUs are online? Now, Linux has ability to shut down a certain core. You can take, actually even processor, you can actually turn it off uh, on the software, you can do that. Uh, this is a list that tells us that the two CPUs, zero and one, are online. Then, we, then it gives us the information about the topology. So we have a, uh, how many sockets do we have? Two sockets, we have one core per socket, we have one thread per core. So on, on the multi-core system, this may be very, very useful knowing that I have two sockets, uh, 10 cores, and then two threads per core. That will explain the number of CPUs visible to the operating system. So that information is not as nicely presented in the previous uh, uh, approach as in here. Also, we have vendor ID, we have a model name, we also have hypervisor detected, plus it shows us the information about the caches. So we have 32 kilobytes of la level 1 data cache, 32 kilobytes of level 1 instruction cache, 4 megabytes or, or 4096 kilobytes of level 2 cache, and 60 mega 16 megabytes of level 3 cache. So that's, that's, that's nice, that's, that's very impressive. So that's uh, LSCPU. Now, there's one more way, one more way how we can run LSCPU, that's minus P, that's parsable output. And it tells us, this output at the, down at the bottom, it tells us the affinity between the cores and the cache uh, areas. So which core uh, talks to which cache, uh, cache, cache area, allowing us to find out how to pin. This is a very good, this is a very good tip, because knowing that, you may pin your application, your separate process of the same application, onto the CPUs or cores that have the same, same cache, allowing the CPUs to, to exchange information very, very fast. If you are not sharing the cache, then the, the, the performance of the application will go a little down. So this is, this is machine parsable output, but it also can be used by uh, a trained eye to find out which core utilizes which cache region. What else is there is that we have a standard tool called getconf. There's a utility called getconf. And if you run it, minus A, it will show us a, a, a long list of variable names with the values. And this is one of the standard ways how you can uh, fetch the configuration of your operating system and also your hardware, uh, your settings. Uh, and and the, the, same, the tool works in the same way on all Linux distributions. So using that tool allows us to develop a cross-distribution tool uh, to, to collect the information. And again, Level one cache sizes, level the, the line association, line sizes, all this information, all these details are here in the getconf output. Okay, now another thing that we want to discuss is the SMBIOS system. That's a very interesting mechanism. It's called System Management BIOS and uh, Desktop Management Interfaces, so the SMBIOS and DMI. These mechanisms basically, those are mm, ways to fetch the hardware um, details of your server, the, the details that have been pre-populated by your vendor. So basically the BIOS exposes a mechanism to read the hardware level information of the, of the system. 
So what, 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 what kind of information can you fetch? For example, you can fetch the serial number of your server, or it's um, SKU, or you can fetch the date of the modification of the BIOS, or the version of the BIOS. What else is there, for instance, and uh, mentioning very useful kinds of information, is how many CPU sockets do you have? So normally you would open up the server, you would shut it down, uh, take it out of the rack cabinet, open it, and see, look physically into the machine to see how many sockets do we have. Now, SMBIOS actually contains this information written in the, in, the, in, the, in the hardware, so you can read the number of sockets we have on the system. And that can save you a lot of time, especially if your data center is somewhere hidden in the desert or under a mountain. So that way you can remotely log into the server, run a particular command, fetch the information, and then you know, for instance, is there a place to plug in a second CPU on the server? Um, just to give you the last example, let's say you plan to do some maintenance of the server, and your vendor um, asks you for the, for the serial number. So they can find out which kind of, which kind of server is this, well, what model is this. All this information is stored in SMBIOS, and you can very easily, very easily uh, fetch it. Now, uh, the command to do that is DMI decode. So here we have an, an example, DMI decode. When you run it, it will show you the series of uh, sections of this, this SMBIOS information telling us information like CPU type, CPU socket features, model, uh, BIOS version, uh, chassis version, and the serial number of a chassis. But also it tells us something about physical connectors. This is also very interesting. You may, for instance, find out how many memory slots do you have on your motherboard. Is it 4? Is it 8? Maybe it's 12, 16? And plus, you can also check which of them are populated with the actual memory chips. Knowing that, you can also fetch information like how much memory or what size of the memory modules are populated on your, socket, on your, on your sockets on the motherboard. So this information is very useful, especially if you plan to, to scale your infrastructure. If you want to make it bigger, then it's good to know that, oh, the following server still has four empty sockets, so we can put more memory chips in it. Uh, plus, and I find this one of the most in, uh, useful um, functionalities of DMI decode, is that you can fetch the information about the chip's ability, the memory controller ability to address certain amount of memory. So let's consider the example. Uh, you have uh, eight slots to, for, to, for, for memory chips, and you have four of them, but they use the maximum amount of addressable memory. So let's say you have eight slots, but you are using 64. You have 64 gigabytes out of 64 uh, supported. Now, if you don't know what is the maximum amount of memory, you may make a mistake of ordering more memory chips and installing them into the server. And nothing will happen. Even though the server has 128 gigabytes of memory, it will not be able to address it. And it will report it still has 64. So this tool, it looks, it looks really not that important, but information you can fetch from it can save you a lot of time, a lot of trouble, and allows us to really deeply investigate what kind of hardware we have. So in this example here, we have just the, what we see is a CPU information. So we have a, a, a Xeon MP, a node one socket. So that's a designation of the socket. We have a signature, we have an ID, manufacturer, flags. So this is a shortened list of flags the CPU uh, supports, the clock, great, the maximum speed, the current speed, and so on and so forth, plus the, the information about the cache. So down below you can see we have uh, six cores, six of them are enabled, and we have 12 threads in total, probably two threads per core. Uh, so mm, DMI, DMI decode, it's an extremely useful tool. In this following examples, we have some information about the CPU cache. Like in here, we have information about the cache sizes. And in here, we have an example of a serial number and a product name. So in this case, it's IBM Blade Center HS22V with the particular model name, model, model mentioned here, the particular UID, serial number. This can be very useful whenever you're searching for bugs, problems, support. Knowing that uh, really helps. Network cards, in another example, we have an Ethernet broad, Broadcom card, Ethernet controller. And then we have uh, physical connectors mentioned, or memory banks. Here's an example of a 
memory bank information. So it says, what is the speed of the memory that's been populated? The location, what is the size of the memory? Form factor, so this is dim memory, 8 gigabytes, 64 bits. Um, and and I, I don't see if we have any error. No, 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 we don't have any error. No, we don't have any error correction codes. So this is a simple memory system. Now the same information as provided by the DMI decode, because DMI decode has a very long output. The same, the same information can be fetched in a small series, uh, or I'd say subsets. If you're going, if you navigate to the sys class DMI directory, and inside of that you will find subdirectories and files in them representing only small portions of the information. So you're interested in BIOS version, there's a file called BIOS version. You cut the file, it will show you what is the actual uh, value. Or chassis serial type, sh serial or, or chassis type, chassis vendor. As you can see, the whole, this, this whole, sec this whole uh, um, set of information is provided as a pseudo file system as well. So cutting the file will tell you exactly what's what's happening now let's move on to the peripheral devices so we know the motherboard we know the cpu we know the power connectors we know the the external uh connectors like keyboards usb stuff now we would like to see what kind of hardware is installed on the motherboard so there are two tools to run to check this information one of them is called lspci the other one is called lsusb and uh, using this tool allows you to very nicely represent what kind of devices are installed. When you run LSPCI, you will see a list of devices. Here's the name of the device and the address on the PCI bus. Now, this is a very nice list. Now, there's, there's one little trick I would like to share with you. LSPCI has an internet provided database of well known recognized devices. Because, let's say today, you have the you have the device installed, and by today LSPCI tool doesn't know what kind of device it is. So it may show you something like unknown vendor or unknown device. Now you can run command called update PCI IDs. The command is update PCI IDs. If you run the command, it will download the latest version of this uh, well-known signatures. So running Update PCI IDs followed by LSPCI again may reveal what kind of unknown device is now known and recognized. This is especially popular with the graphics cards. You may have an unknown device, basically VGA, VGA type device. And then after, after updating your PCI IDs, you may find out that this is the most recent graphics card of one of the manufacturers. So LSPCI is one tool, very, very interesting. Now, the LSPCI actually allows us to run it with the dash V and dash, dash VV options. Well, that will expand information for each and every detected device, and it will show you a lot of details. Sometimes it's even too much. You may have the, the interrupt information. You may have the driver information. You may have the features, the power consumption. The whole lot of information can be fetched with the LSPCI minus V. So what you see here, this is just one part of the, this is one device, that one. So that network card has the following properties. Uh, there's a physical slot, control, uh, status, latency, interrupts, region, memory regions, capabilities. Uh, and also, this is interesting, you can find kernel driver, that line in here. That's very useful because uh, you may have a device and may you, know, you may not know which driver provides its functionality, the LSPCI-VV will show you the loaded driver. Another very useful tool is USB. So this, the, the tool is LSUSB. It's this one. So when you run it, it's going to detect well-known signatures, vendor signatures and device signatures, and compare them against detected, hard drive, uh, detected uh, hardware. So you may find out that your keyboard is coming from manufacturer X and your mouse is coming from this different manufacturer and your USB thumb drive is coming from the third manufacturer. So the same story here, LSUSB will show you the USB connected devices. Uh, plus you can run it LSUSB minus VV, minus single V, double VV, I believe you can run it even with three VVs. And what you're going to get is a similar output which tells us 
what kind of device is this, which class of device, is it a hub, is it a peripheral, is it a, a mouse or a keyboard, is it a storage device, but also it can inf contain information like power consumption or power draw, uh, plus the driver that supports that device. So LSUSB, that's another very, very useful utility. Now there's another tool we would like to, to show you, tell you about, that's uh, LS Topo. LS Topo. It comes from the it comes from the package called HW Lock. And you have a tool called LS Topo. This is basically list topology. It will try to show us graphically, it's a graphical tool. It will display the relationships between devices, their their position on the bus, it will list all the buses, it will show what is connected to where. And if you don't have graphical environment, you may run LS Topo No Graphics. That's one word with dashes between them. So LS Topo dash no dash graphics. And that will show you the text output, and it will try to show you the child parent relationships between devices. So you may find out what is connected where, and for example, you may understand which network card is plugged into which PCI slot. Right. Uh, we have some other tools allowing us to fetch the hardware information. So LSHW, LS Hardware, List Hardware. Uh, when you run it, it's going to show you a whole list of devices that are detected in some uh, it, its own custom format. You may run LSHW as uh, dash dash short to make it dash short to, to make uh, output slightly, slightly more dense. Uh, we can run LSHW minus C as a class, so we can specify I want to see my system devices, maybe my network devices, storage devices. It's like one generic tool that works pretty much the same way on all Linux distributions. Now there's one more thing to conclude this section of the, of the chapter. Uh, a lot of modern computers can uh, and will track and store uh, hardware errors in, in some dedicated memory, usually a dedicated chip. And there is a standard mechanism that's, uh, th th that's in the industry, it's called the RAS, so that stands for Reliability, Availability, and Serviceability. Uh, we can fetch the RAS information as it's stored in the hardware, fetch it to the, to the, through a daemon, and then display on the, on the console. So in order to work with that, you need a daemon called RAS daemon. So you install RAS daemon, you enable the, it, and then you have a tool called the RAS MCCTL. With this tool, you can configure, you can check the summary, you can fetch the errors that happened during the lifetime of your server. So for instance, if there were memory allocation problems, hardware memory allocation problems, or page lookups, or maybe lockups of the CPU, or, or the problem that hit me some time ago, a broken cache, level two cache of the CPU was broken, and every time the system would try to use it, the server would do a cold reboot. So this is not something you can easily and, 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 and easily uh, debug. Having RAS daemon running, you can collect the information, fetch the historical information, and then see what happened. So uh, no, having a RAS daemon is actually very, very useful, and I highly recommend that to be enabled and installed on your servers. Now we're going to have a guided exercise displaying physical resources. Please do it yourself. Um, follow the instructions in the book. Uh, and let's see each other in the next video.